That's the sleepy sign. Welcome to the Radical Parenting Podcast. My name is Tony Shawcross. And I'm Kara Porba. This week we're going to be talking about a book called Strange Situation, A Mother's Journey into the Science of Attachment. Uh, it's a book by Bethany Saltman. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, Kara, how did you come across this book? What made you pick it out? She was a guest on Janet Lansbury's podcast. Mm -hmm. I immediately wanted to read her book for a kind of a strange reason, which was that she was very open about her sort of, um, her negative feelings about, about motherhood, um, which I found really, I, I was really drawn to, um, even though I don't have super strong negative feelings, I have some, of course, and we just like don't talk about them very much. And she does talk about it some in the book, but that was actually the main reason I picked this book as one that I wanted to read. Cool. And have you read much or learned much about attachment science before? Only a little bit, but you know, I had heard mostly about Bowlby. I never even heard of Mary Ainsworth, which was, which was this writer's main, like, um, I don't think she studied with her or met her. I think Mary Ainsworth probably died a few many years ago, but um, that was her main like idol or person that she was researching. Yeah, and 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 for good reason, because yeah, I think I mean when it comes to science of attachment around children, um, she is kind of like the 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 person, right? Apparently so. I just learned that. I had read Attached, uh, the book Attached, which is more about adult adult relationships um i wasn't a huge fan of it in part because of the context under which i was reading it but i really loved this book and i really loved what it said about about parenting and 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 the kind of insight and guidance it gives you to to um give your children the best chance you can at being a happy fulfilled you know self-confident uh, person. So yeah, I can't wait to get into it. Let's, let's start talking about it. Yeah. What was your like biggest takeaway? What did you love? Um, well, I mean, one thing for me is it, it, I, I had to get over the fact that it's, it is really her story. You know, it is Bethany Saltman talking about learning about attachment, becoming uh, a scientist herself involved with, with, uh, with attachment with children, uh, really reflecting a lot on her childhood, her experiences with her, with her parents, one kind of incident that she had some real like fear and worry about, uh, her own insecurities about parenting. So it's really is her, you learn a lot about attachment science, but you're learning about it through her, through her journey, which is pretty cool. Um, the first book, this is completely unrelated, but the first book I ever read about quantum physics was called Schrodinger's Cat, and or In Search of Schrodinger's Cat. And uh, it just tells kind of the life story, the personal stories of all of the players in the, in, in the burgeoning science of quantum physics when it was first coming about. And I really loved that, that personal take on it instead of just reading kind of the dry science or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I, liked, I liked this story. And yeah, it, you have to be getting into it because you're interested in a mother's journey into the science of attachment, not just the science of attachment. Uh, but once I, once I got into that, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it and gave me a lot to reflect on in my own childhood and my own parenting. Yeah. I could really relate to her stories at the beginning of the book where, you know, she talks about um, there's a style of parenting called attachment parenting popularized by Dr. Sears um, which of course was is very famous and like I read those books and things when when I was pregnant and um, I really related to her on the those are two very different things by the way right attachment research and the science of attachment and attachment parenting is really something totally else it just happens to have the same name you know I did a lot of those attachment parenting things and enjoyed them you know I mean I breastfed my daughter for two and a half years we still co-sleep and she's five and a half you know, I carried her a lot. Um, we were, you know, I did a lot of those things and I still have, you know, this overwhelming sense of, you know, the, the, um, the amount of sacrifice that that involves, right? On like my autonomy as a human and 
all of that. So I was I was really interested in, um, you know, how to uh, her whole journey of coming to this attachment um, science with um, without being like the um, the model of like perfect motherly love, right? Like she had a lot of frustration and anger and resentment as as a mom. Yeah. Well, let's just jump into it. I know we both have notes and I think we also both went on a couple of um, uh, kind of rabbit holes, you know, like it got it got me interested in learning a little bit more about B.F. Skinner, uh, who we had addressed in um, in relation to unconditional parenting, uh, the Alfie Cohn book and a couple. Of, he's come up in a few of these books. He's kind of always the antithesis. He's He's the behaviorist. So he's kind of like classical conditioning kind of proponent with child raising. So he's kind of the the foil or the antitheme to most of these books that we're reading. Um, and early on in the book, they talk about the, the uh, baby tender, the, the, the baby box. Right. Where they were kind of saying BF Skinner kind of represents this, this idea that kids really just needed food. They don't really need to, to be held. And so BF Skinner even invented this box that would like, you know, like a, a hamster feeder or something like that, that would like kind of keep their baby at the right temperature and, and uh, make it so they didn't really have to, that this machine would take care of their baby and they wouldn't really have to. I did that, right. And I remember in the book, she actually says something like, he actually raised one of his kids in the box. Yeah. And I was like, like, what? Like, how does that, how did that turn out? So I'll, I'll post a, a link to a Snopes article and a couple other articles I did. It it really isn't, it, he wasn't the monster that, that some people kind of paint him to be and that his daughter, who was the baby that was raised in the, in the Skinner box, um, she she goes on records at several different times saying like this has been blown way out of proportion i wasn't like an experiment raised in a box they just they just you know th it was a good idea it kept me at the right temperature it kept me from you know uh it kept me, whatever so um yeah i'll share some of those links and but she wasn't in it all the time yeah she wasn't in it all the time a lot of the a lot, here i'll pull up the I'll pull up the Snopes article, but it is pretty incredible that this research came out of that time where people thought you could put a baby in a box and like all they need is um, to be at the right temperature and have some food available. And then, you know, this the attachment research just goes in this whole other direction. Yeah. So it's really hard to see this teeny little image, but this is this is Jeff Skinner's daughter in in the Skinner box. And uh, yeah, her name is Deborah, and she she speaks about it later. She says, "My father's intentions were simple, based on removing you know clothes and sheets and blankets. They wanted they wanted me to to be warm, and it wasn't what it what it seems to be." Um, Oh, yeah. So she says, there's this story that after my father let me out, I became psychotic. Well, I didn't. That I sued him in a court of law is also untrue. And contrary to hearsay, I didn't shoot myself in a bowling alley in Billings, Montana. I've never been to Billings, Montana. So she just said that wow. she actually was in support of this and, and she still got lots of loving attention and affection from, from, her, uh, okay. from her parents. So it was more like a crib, more like a crib that would keep the baby warm without a bunch of blankets and yeah. sheets and stuff. Yeah, That totally. does seem like a much better, better idea. Yeah, and there were other experiments that were just saying that, you know, thinking at the time that food was like the primary driver for uh, for for kids and that in some ways fathers didn't even matter because they weren't, you know, breastfeeding babies. And and then the, there were these other experiments that, that showed that, like, um, you know, if a monkey could be raised by two different kind of robot monkeys and one is like just like a a metal machine that like gives it food and the other one is like a terry cloth covered soft um, monkey robot that didn't give it any food, they would always prefer the, the terry cloth one. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's actually totally relevant, but the, a lot of these experiments just kind of getting rid of this idea that that babies really just are wanting food, that they actually need love, yeah. they need attention, they need physical contact um, in order to develop healthily. Although there is a fun joke amongst breastfeeding moms when your babies like are all about the boob. It's like, I'm, my eyes are up here, I'm up here. My face is up here, baby. Because they're pretty into the boob at the beginning. But anyway, I'm sure they like 
are loving the closeness and the so actually that's a perfect segue because what I loved about um this book is she she says over and over and over again that what she discovered and what Mary Ainsworth discovered and taught was that attachment isn't about a set of behaviors or like a checklist of how to do things the right way that is not about breastfeeding versus bottle feeding or whatever that it's about the um attunement between the 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 parent and the baby and the responsiveness and the relationship it's like every podcast we do right it always comes back to like it's about the relationship between us and our child and i just thought of that because you know i remember um you know when i was breastfeeding it because you know it's pretty can be pretty time intensive and it be, can become like a sort of another like um, part of the grind kind of thing and i remember janet lansbury had a thing about um putting down your phone when you were breastfeeding and like actually having that time where you're really paying attention to your baby and like communing with them and having a, a relationship there versus it being just a feeding experience about nutrition. Um, Cause I mean, I think after the first year, it's not even really that much about nutrition, like the nutrition of breast milk t- totally changes over time as the baby grows. And it's, it's really, it's about something else at that point. Um, so, you know, she talks about mutual delight. Those are like the two words that I will take away from this book is that um, securely attached infants and their primary attachment figure have this mutual delight. And so she says attachment is like an internal experience. It's about like what's happening inside for the parent and the baby versus a like a, a right set of of actions or behaviors that we can you know d- in inflict upon our <laughs> that's not the right word but you know what i mean like i will do this upon my baby and then they will turn out xyz way yeah so uh my son um is kind of in a new experiment of of his phase of life in that he's spending he spent his first full year with his mother in in south carolina and my visits were 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 um you know kind of short and we didn't have overnights until he was almost one and um so he's really just been with his mother 24 7 since birth and starting on his first birthday <clears throat> um he's started now coming here to denver uh for uh 10 days at a time uh once a month he just completed i think his third uh his third 10 day visit here and it was really interesting to note that you know, I was really braced for him to have some real attachment issues. And Kara and I took took a couple of classes. I read a few books just concerned about the, about minimizing any possible like damage or impact or attachment injuries that could be that could come as a result of, of these visits. And I was really surprised that on his first visit, he was great. I was ready for him to, you know, to really miss his mom. I really wanted her to actually come out here with him so that he could still have that kind of daily uh, input. But um, he ended up being great. And he was, he was not just great with me, but he was great with his grandparents, his paternal grandparents and, and his cousins, his aunt and uncles. And then on his second 10 day visit and third, he became like less okay with everyone else. He became, he became more clingy with me and, and his mother reported that he had become way more clingy with her. And there's a passage in chapter five of the book uh, where it says, while we often think that babies not responding differently to different caretakers is a good thing, we think that that's a sign of a certain degree of self-deficiency. Um, Mary Ainsworth began to believe that the opposite is true, that being able to discriminate one's attachment figures from all others is the infant's first step in developing an attachment. So, um, yeah, so it, it goes on to say, like, while secure babies may enjoy the affections of many people, attachment theory posits that babies benefit from having one special relationship, one or more special relationship, even in cultures where babies are cared for by their whole, like, kind of village. Babies who didn't seem particularly affected by age one, by an attachment figure's departure and return, might actually be impacted by upsets and anxieties in their lives that negatively impact their attachment development. So the point is, is that 
I was worried that he became more clingy and so was his mom a little bit, but actually it's a sign of a healthy, his healthy attachment to us. And then, um, and then once he's more and more secure with that healthy attachment, then he becomes more, uh, secure with, with interaction with others. So, uh, a lot of this book was reassuring to me. And the book was also a big story of, of Bethany Saltman feeling reassured by the more she learned about, about attachment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It makes sense that, you know, if, if Arlo is away from his mom for 10 days, if that had no impact on him whatsoever, that would be worrisome, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that the courts, you know, knew what they were doing when they said like, before you can even do that, you have to have these longer and longer kind of overnight stays with him there. You have to be a more present force in his life. So, you know, doing daily calls yeah. with him and, and all that stuff. And I really think that, 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 that worked. I really think that they, that helped ensure that we had a strong bond and a strong connection before he ever came here so that he could right. still feel very cared for and, and still feel what a child needs in terms of, of attachment. Yeah. And you were like a very primary person in his life by that point, you were spending lots of time with him before his first yeah. 10 day. I feel slightly reassured, but I also feel like I can kind of relate to Bethany's. Um, I, I did start to get a little annoyed with it, but I also very much identify with her almost neurotic, like obsession with like, am I securely attached or am I not? Or is, and is my daughter going to be or not? And like, how can I find out? And um, you know, she goes through this whole process of she does the adult attachment interview on herself, which you normally can't really request. Apparently, it's only like a research tool. And she somehow got it done on her mom. She became a coder. She and her husband both became coders for the adult attachment interview, learned how to give the interview and and code all of the, the responses. And um, yeah, I, I, I so identify with that because I basically think I'm securely attached, but then I'll read something and I think, oh, well, what if I have like a little bit of like anxious attachment or disorganized attachment or whatever. And, you know, like looking at my daughter through that lens and everything. And I, I think she's like pretty damn secure. And, um, but I, it's, uh, of course I do like to better myself as a, you know, that's like why we do this. Right. So um, one of the things I really went deep into in a rabbit hole is uh, Mary Ainsworth's maternal scales of sensitivity. Oh, sorry, maternal sensitivity scales. And this was like my favorite part of the book. And it was in the last, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, mm -hmm. the, the, the epilogue. I thought I had finished the book, um, the audio book, and then I realized there's this like hour, hour and a half long epilogue with a bunch of new research in it. And at the very end, she talks about these maternal scale, maternal sensitivity scales. And um, I just like kind of do dove into these for the first time today, and I'm going to like go back and, and read even more about it. But they're, they're very, I found Mary Ainsworth's writing like really charming and like so descriptive of like you know the actual daily life with a child you know I really loved her her descriptions and her writing and um let me see if I can find the there's four scales and I think they tie into radical honesty so well and radical parenting um scale number one is sensitivity versus insensitivity to the baby's signals and of course, she called them maternal sensitivity scales because way back in the 50s or whenever it was, mothers were primarily the main caregivers. Um, but this could go for any attachment figure. And the, the sensitivity to baby signals, she divides into four things, the awareness of the signals. So that would be like, in radical honesty, we just call that noticing, where you're actually perceiving with your senses, what is happening, you know, with the child, their, their noises, their facial expressions, their gestures, everything about it, right? Um, like really noticing um, the baby and what they're doing. And then number two um, is accurately interpreting those signals. So the main thing there is um, the mother's ability or the, the attachment figure's ability to 
be free from distortions of the mind. So she has to not have her own, like, you know, basically psychological trauma is how I think of it, um, disturb her from accurately interpreting the baby's signals. Um, and, you know, that's like, I was just listening to one of our former podcast episodes with that you did, Tony, with Attain, and she talks a lot about that, like parents um, getting over their own baggage through therapy or whatever means. Um, and I think that is so that we can cleanly, clearly interpret our children without projecting a bunch of stuff on, on their signals. And then um, after we are aware of the signal, accurately interpret them, then making an appropriate response to them. So, you know, that's like picking them up when they want to be picked up, putting them down when they want to crawl around and explore, playing when they want to play, feeding when they're hungry, you know, versus like trying to read a book to a child who's um, starving or something, uh, an appropriate response. And then the last one is a prompt response. So that the child knows that their behavior had some impact on the the attachment figure's response and that they have some kind of agency there. So that's the first scale. Um, sensitivity versus insensitivity to the baby's signals. And she has like, it's a scale from one to nine and she has descriptions of each number, you know, from highly insensitive all the way up to highly sensitive. And then um, the second scale, which is like, you know, prime directive parenting, as you like to call it, Tony, cooperation versus interference with the baby's ongoing behavior. She just like nails it on the head right there. Mm -hmm. um, so the central issue of this scale is the extent to which the mother's interventions or initiations of interaction break into or interrupt the baby's ongoing activity rather than being geared in both timing and quality of the baby's state, mood, and current interests. So I found this one really fascinating. She writes a lot about it in mm -hmm. addition to having the, the descriptions of the scale from one to nine. And this is what we've talked about over and over again so much, you know. Um, some parents are high, you know, so this is what Ainsworth says. Some parents are highly interfering in an, in an overwhelming physical sense, such as, you know, snatching the baby up, moving them about, confining him, releasing him um, with utter disregard for his activity and process. Um, and then she also talks about a parent who is highly interfering, not in a physical sense, but because they are at the baby most of the time, instructing, training, eliciting, directing, controlling. So um, I, you know, I see that I, I can see that popping up in myself sometimes of like where I'm just going into like everything she's doing is I want her to stop. Right. And I have to go into a, um, a different mode there. So, yeah, I look, I just, um, her, if I will put the link in the show notes because the there, I just had so much fun reading the way that she described all of this. You can tell this is a woman who has spent, thousands how god knows how many hours really observing parents and babies and i mean it's different to do it now than it was at that time too because everything she was saying there was really flying in the face of like conventional wisdom around parenting so yeah i have a lot of i have a lot of admiration for her and before we go on to the third scale i love this yeah. th this second one you know it's cooperation versus interference um my 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 son's mother has frequently remarked that she thinks like oh we're we have drastically different um parenting philosophies and to me this is the probably the most important one and when i watch um i don't get to see them together very often but when i do see my son with his mother uh this is the character i would i would describe her her i would characterize her interaction with him as very cooperative like she lets him lead she follows his lead she's in tune with what he wants and is accommodating of of him just exploring and 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 whatnot and she's there on board with him uh i see her mother for example with with him and it's the it's the opposite she's always presenting him with toys always presenting him with with 
activities. Like it's her job to say, oh, isn't this cool? And here's how it works or whatever. And, and not to right. not to denigrate anybody's interaction, but but I yeah, I disagree with my my ex that we have such radically different parenting philosophies because um, that core thing, which is probably the most important thing to me, um, I mean, these other th three scales are also very important, and I think she's got those in, in spades as well. But, but uh, this one particularly, um, yeah, it's kind of rare. I mean, I love I love seeing parents who yeah. really let the children lead and follow their children's lead. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool that you guys have that in common. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she knows we have it in common, but I do. Well, maybe not. And you know, and and some people who sort of oppose this line of of thinking will say things like, well, if, if I don't, if I'm not the authority as the parent, then the children are running the household and that will never work. And it's not that, you know, um, like I, Ainsworth describes it as um, co-determined. I like that word. Um, she says, sensitive, a sensitive mother integrates her wishes, moods, and household responsibilities with the baby's wishes, moods, and ongoing activity. Their interactions and shifts of activity seem co-determined. So it's not that the baby is like totally in charge and they're the boss of the house or something, but co-determined. So the mother might delay her interruption until a natural break has occurred in the baby's play. Or may set the mood for a transition or, you know, bedtime or whatever, rather than an eliciting, inviting cooperation rather than imposing it upon him. She talks about, um, yeah, what you were mentioning, Tony, about um, your mother-in-law, like presenting a toy or whatever. So a lot of parents will like try to elicit a certain type of play from a child or a certain kid, a certain sound or whatever. And so she talks about um, you know, so this was Ainsworth back in, I don't know what year, this was like before, you know, Janet Lansbury and, and I wonder if Magda Gerber was around this same time, I don't know the time frame, but you know, she's already talking about um, a mother tending to pick up on something the baby does and responding to their initiations of play. And if the mother initiates and the baby doesn't respond, then she shifts to something else. Um, and she also talks about, you know, back going back to the first scale, she also talks about that an attuned response or an appropriate response doesn't necessarily mean the baby always gets its way, that a sense of response sometimes may not be complying with the baby's wish, you know, um, for, for whatever reason, but that the sensitive parent always um, acknowledges the baby's wishes or or mood or whatever anything else before we go on to scale three no yeah let's let's keep going and again these these are the scales that she determines is like how how kind of attuned and and well cared for the, the attachment needs of the child are yes and so scale three and i think those first two are probably the most juiciest the scale three is psychological and physical availability versus ignoring and neglect so um, actually, this one's pretty juicy for me. So the central issue of this scale is the mother's accessibility, meaning she's just physically present, but also psychologically like available. And also her um, not just being there, but also her responsiveness. So this is actually one I have a hard time with. I'm physically present pretty much all the time that I'm not at work or my child's not at school, I, it, it is very hard for me to divide my attention and switch my attention. Um, I can get really wrapped up in something and it's difficult for me. Those are some of the times when I get most frustrated with my daughter is when, you know, she may need something from me or she may interrupt whatever because she, um, you know, has, just wants to talk to me for a second or share something with me. And it, it is, it's very hard for me to switch back and forth. So, um, you know, she talks in this scale about um, a mother, an accessible mother can divide her attention between the baby and other person's things, activities without losing awareness of the baby. I don't do that very well, actually. Um, she, she's never too preoccupied with her own thoughts and feelings. 
or with her other activities to have to not have a sense of where baby is and what baby is doing. Now, I will say she's actually talking about infants. So I will say when my daughter was an infant, yeah, I pretty much always knew where she was and, and what she was doing. So that probably is changes somewhat as they grow up, you know, like we don't have to like watch them every second, like a, like, you know, a three month old. Um, and then, you know, she talks about different um, ways that parents can ignore the baby where sometimes they can just be physically unaware of what's happening. If the child is in a far enough room away where they just don't hear the sounds that the child might be making, they have, they don't check on them to see if they need anything versus some parents, and this would be the more pathological, being aware of a baby's signals and choosing not to respond and being purposely not responsive for whatever um, reasons. Anything else, Tim, Tony? No, let's do the fourth one. Acceptance versus rejection of baby's needs. Yeah. So, and this is the one that kind of got me interested, you know, when I was hearing Bethany Saltman talk in her interview with Janet Lansbury about her own positive and negative feelings about being a mother, you know, and obviously attachment's really important to her and, and being a parent is really important to her. And yet she has these negative feelings as well. So this scale is about like, the balance and the integration between the mother's positive and negative feelings about her baby. Um, and the, the extent to which she's been able to in, she has been able to integrate that conflict. So I, and I sort of love that Mary Ainsworth says, you know, we're assuming that there are negative feelings, you know, that when you have a baby, you know, your, your autonomy is, is greatly reduced you know, if you're not neglecting and, and ignoring your baby and um, that the at the, the positive pole, that the love and acceptance and warmth of the relationship, you know, um, kind of subsumes the, the frustrations and irritations, but but not that they're that they don't exist, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm just kind of learning about these for the first time, but uh, one thing that stands out for me and that has come up in every single book we've read, I mean, it's really one of the very few kind of like directives that has come up in every single book we've read is Mary Ainsworth mentioning that you, mothers have to take care of themselves. They have to have boundaries. They have to, they have to not just be in the constant sacrifice mode in order to take good care of their children. They have to, they have to have self care. And she, she says somewhere about like a pseudo accepting mother where they, where they, yeah. where they, you know, they, they comply with the baby's demands, but, but they comply kind of masochistically and in this suffering way where there's this like repressed aggression that's underneath um, and how totally like unhealthy that is and how much more healthy it is to just say like, I know you need this right now and I can't give it to you. So like, I'm going to, you know, take care of myself so I can later take care of you. Uh, every book we've read has said how important that is for moms. And I think it's a challenge for a lot of moms. I, I personally just think it could be a challenge for Kara. I, I personally think it could be a challenge for the mother of my, my child. Um, I don't get to spend enough time with my child yet to get really burnt out on, on it, on it. So, uh, but yeah. yeah. I got like a little bit of chills, like hearing you talk about it. Cause that one really struck me as well. You know, she says, she, Ainsworth writes, you know, it is healthy for a person, even a mother, to give vent to angry feelings rather than try to submerge them with the consequence that they may simmer for long periods of time during which they color the tone of behavior and interfere with positive feelings. And that is like a perfect description of radical honesty right there. That it's like if we ignore something that is present within us, it does color and impinge upon our free sense of relating to this person. So, you know, she talks about mothers who are largely, you know, warm and accepting, having these brief surges of, of anger or annoyance, um, but not taking it out on the baby. Um, and, and that uh, the sensitive mother will acknowledge the baby's anger and frustration and, and express her own, you know, exasperation without, you know, blaming the, the child. Um, 
or she may step away to cool off or, you know, whatever, but she doesn't hold on to that and let it simmer and harbor those resentments long term where it um, turns into this sort of like yucky, you know, rejecting false things. So yeah, and um, I love that description that she gives about this pseudo patient, long suffering way of responding in a sort of socially um, uh, approved like version of motherhood. But when actually what's underneath it is this repressed, you know, resentment or, or uh, aggression, she even says. So yeah, I'm very, I'm so fascinated by all of that because I'm really committed to like, how can I vent my anger and frustration without taking it on my child? Because it's there, it's got to go somewhere. So, you know, I do that in listening time with my listening partners. I do that with my friends and with other ways. Um, but I know that it's there and that I have to get it, get it out so that it doesn't color my relationship long term with my daughter. And I'm glad that also she can see me sometimes lose my cool. And then I can apologize or, or say, man, I got really mad and I was loud, you know, like, was that, did that, did that scare you? And I'm sorry that I got so mad right then, you know, um, you didn't do anything wrong. I was having a moment. Yeah. And in radical honesty, for the most part, we want to directly express cleanly and directly express any anger, resentment, we, anger or resentment we feel towards the person we're feeling it towards. The one exception uh, to that is, is children. Um, and so, yeah, in radical honesty, we don't, uh, we, well, I think Mary Ainsworth even said, um, where is it? Um, yeah. Like, uh, so a mother that is, that is, um, accepting baby's needs and taking care of herself, she says, uh, does not consider the baby himself as a suitable target on which to focus her anger. Um, so yeah, the, the, we can feel this and, and, and express it cleanly, like Kara said to, to all kinds of other people. And if it does come out sideways directly, indirectly with children, it's not the end of the world. We can, we can apologize and, and make good for it. But for the most part, uh, in radical honesty, we like to clearly fully express and experience any resentment or we anger we have with the person we feel that anger towards with the exception of, of children. And, and in radical honesty, when we're doing that work, it's about more than saying the words. It's about like really having the experience expressing the, you know, like the heat in your body or the, the pulsing of blood or the, you know, your heart beating. And it's about experiencing all of those sensations and, and being in it until it kind of passes through your body. It's like processing that anger using your body rather than talking about it in a cognitive way. So, and I think with children, it's kind of the reverse. Like I, I experiment sometimes with telling my daughter with saying, you know, I'm mad at you for um, whatever it is, right? Only because I think that that is more cleaner than like a big guilt trip about well, I asked you not to do that. And as then you like, you know, I can't think of an example right now. You, you know, like, okay. I, I remember one example. I wonder if I've shared this already on the podcast. There was one time where we used to go for bike rides every day and my daughter would switch all the gears on my bike. And then it would get really messed up when we were trying to go for our bike ride and I couldn't get my gears on my bike to work. And one day I was so mad. She had done it again. I had asked her not to. And I was giving her this whole lecture about it. And like, I asked you not to, and this really messes up my bike. And now I'm going to have to take it to the shop and pay money and blah, blah, blah. And then I realized what I was doing. And I was like, actually, I think it would be better for me to say, I'm mad at you for moving the gears on my bike. And that's what I did. And it actually worked better in terms of like, she wasn't defending against this lecture or like guilt trip that I was trying to give her. She was just like, oh, you know, I did this thing and my mom didn't like it. And we were, it, I don't remember how that worked out, but it got better. So yeah, I, it's, it's like a tightrope of like, 
I'm not going to go full tilt on like exp being having have being loud and angry and, and aggressive with her. That's what I don't ever want to do. But I think saying the words in a non radical honesty way is um, sometimes better than the lecture guilt, guilt trip. At some age, we want our children to understand and accept that we get mad at them and for it not to be the end of the world, you know, like I, I would, yeah, I would, I would hate for my child to think I never get mad at him or to think it's really that big of a deal that I get mad at him and, and vice versa. You know, it's, it isn't that big of a deal, but we want to wait and do that when it's developmentally appropriate and they can kind of process those things. Yeah. Right. And when it's not, and when being angry doesn't mean anything other than, oh, I have this flash of like, ah, versus when being angry doesn't mean I don't love you anymore, or you're bad, or you did something wrong. It's like when those get conflated is when it gets really dangerous. Towards the end, one of the things that I, I loved, uh, I had just listened to uh, an interview with Tina Payne Bryson, who co-wrote The Yes Brain, which is one of maybe my favorite book that we've read in the podcast um, on Janet Lansbury's uh, Unruffled uh, podcast. Uh, and they, they kind of said something like, all you really have to do is be present and connected. Tina Payne Bryson pretty much said that, like, forget all these hundreds of chapters and rules and scales and whatever. All you have to do is be present and connected with, with your child. Um, yeah. And I loved hearing that. And, and, and I, there was a conversation where uh, the author of, of Strange Situation, Bethany Saltman, uh, was talking with John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, it's referenced in chapter 31 of this book where, where, he, where she's kind of overcomplicating, you know, the, the job of being a parent. And he essentially just says, all you have to do is be present and connected with your child. <laughs> yeah. And that it's not about any kind of rule book or script or, you know, like these scales, I think are pretty cool because it shows all it's like describing ways of, of being present and connected, right? Of like being attuned, being really perceptive and responsive. And in the moment, you know, the scales don't don't help. It's like, oh, that internal, you know, this is maybe the last thing that I want to say is that internal experience piece, you know, she talks about that attachment is, you know, we observe all these behaviors on the outside because that's what science can observe, but it's an internal experience. So like, I remember the other day I was in the car with my daughter and she was really having a hard time with like something I can't remember. And I was starting to go into this sort of like toolbox mode of like, I know what to do when my kid is upset. I'm going to say this or that or the other, and I'm going to be like empathize with her and stuff. And like, it wasn't working at all. And then I realized, yeah, cause I'm just like reading a script basically. And then I said nothing. And I like really felt inside, like, like as if I was with a friend or anyone who was like really hurting about something like, yeah, she's really, having a painful moment here there's something she's hurting about and it doesn't matter if i understand it or not and then like everything changed and i didn't say anything to her but there must have been something that changed about my demeanor or whatever i said next that like because of that internal experience of really accepting our relationship like changed in that moment so that's a big one for me in this book, her talking about that, that internal experience of attachment. Yeah. Great. Well, what else do you want to say about this book? Again, I really liked it. It made me reflect on my, my childhood. Um, I found myself kind of what landmark and people who do landmark education call like navel gazing. I, I found myself kind of navel gazing and reflecting on my childhood a lot and reading the book and, and reading about her kind of just very, uh, very self absorbed and focused on, on, on her childhood and her experiences. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I really got a lot out of it. What, what anything else you 
pulled out that you wanted to talk about? I think that's it for me. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, thank you again for, for, for recommending it. Uh, we will uh, put some links to to the book itself, uh, as well as uh, to more more info that you can read about Mary Ainsworth, uh, about the about the BF Skinner baby tender baby box, um, and a few other a few other links. Uh, tell us again what we're gonna be talking about next week. We're gonna talk about this online course that me and Tony have been looking at. It's called the Positive Parenting Solutions Course by Amy McCready. Yeah, so I look forward to that. Thank you for joining us at the Radical Parenting Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.